Now, I'm going to make a deal with you. I'm not going to speak long. And everybody says, that's the wrong place to say amen, but it's all right. Your part is, I want you to give your very best attention. And uh, I want to speak to you tonight from a certain verse of the Bible. In fact, once I take you to the verse and show you the verse, if you'll mark it in your Bible, I'm going to come back to it tomorrow night, and I'm going to come back to it Sunday night. It's amazing how much truth God can pack into one verse of the Bible. A few days ago, I was speaking in Georgia. And at the end of the meeting, a very kind gentleman came up to me in the lobby of the church where I was, and he was very kind speaking to me after the service. And I looked at him, and he had a, a beautiful lapel pin. I'd never seen anything quite like it before, and I pointed to it, and I said, I like that. Tell me about that. And he got emotional. He took something out of his pocket. He handed me a little card, a little brochure, in fact, that had a picture on the front of it of a police officer named Tim Brackeen. And it says on it, Remembering Our Hero. And he said to me, This is my son. And he said, My son gave his life in the line of duty. He was a canine officer. He was two years younger than me killed in protecting people, a first responder. It has on it his birthday and his death day, but that's not really the story of his life. He said to me, this is a little something my wife and I wrote about our son, and I expected it would be, you know, this young man's life story and all it accomplished and all of that, and that's not what it was. And when I got back to my hotel room that night and opened it up, started to read it, I discovered that this was a piece about how to know Jesus as your Savior. And the way it began was this father and mother who lost their son. But it wasn't really lost because they knew where he was. He's with Jesus. He's in heaven now. They began it this way. Our son was a good man, and he did a good work, and he died for a good purpose. But he is not in heaven because he was a good man or did a good work or died for a good purpose. He's in heaven because he had placed his faith in Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. I've been keeping this on my desk and looking at it as a reminder to me of what truly matters. See, in time, everything fades except for the things that are connected to God. And that's why I want to draw your attention this week to this amazing verse. If you have a Bible, I want you to open your Bible. And if you don't, we're going to put it on the screen for you to help you tonight. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13. Now, if you know 1 Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians is a famous chapter. 1 Corinthians 13, a famous chapter because it is the classic passage on the love of God. It's the great charity chapter of the Bible. And before the week is done, we'll talk about the word charity. But tonight I want to begin in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse number 13, not with charity but with faith. Would you look at 1 Corinthians 13, 13 with me? It says this, and now... Abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. The three words here that God says, these things last. How many of you have lived long enough to know everything doesn't last? How many of you ever bought a car that didn't last? Yeah. How many of you know you can build a brand new house and put the best stuff in it, and even that doesn't last? And some of you young people, you think your health is going to last forever. Your energy is going to last forever. Let me just let you in on a little secret. Even that doesn't last forever. Amen. Your children seem like they're the same age forever, don't they? Until they're not. Our oldest is here getting ready to get married. Lord, help us all. I'm at a juncture in my life where I'm realizing lots of things don't last. They just don't last. Good things don't last. And in fact, when you look at our country right now, Lots of things have changed in the last few months. Would you agree with that? Promises don't always last when men make them. Peace does not always last. Governments do not always last. Buildings do not always last. Trends do not always last. Laws do not always last. But let me show you some things that will last. Would you like to know what really lasts? Would you like to know what you can build your whole life on would you like to know what you can bank eternity on? This is what lasts because it's rooted in the eternal God. 
There are three of them. Mark them in your Bible. The Bible says faith, hope, charity. Say those three words with me, would you please? Faith, hope, charity. One more time. Faith, hope, charity. Now, we got a world that needs a whole lot of charity right now. Agreed? And I know a lot of people that could use a good dose of hope, but notice he doesn't begin with hope or charity. He begins with faith. Why is that? Because without faith, Hebrews says, it is impossible to please God. You see, every good thing in time and eternity begins with faith in God. Faith is what brings you to God and what brings all of God's resources to you. That's why Jesus said to his first followers in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, have faith in God. He didn't say have faith in government. He didn't say have faith in men. As a matter of fact, do you know what the middle verse of the Bible is? If you took this Bible and cut it right in the middle and found the exact middle verse of the Bible, the middle verse of the Bible says, ready? It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. That's a pretty good middle verse of the Bible. That's the anchor. That's the center. That's... That's the circumference of it all. That's the thread, the theme that weaves through all of the Bible. Look, men, even the best men are just men at best. Men will disappoint you. Let me let you know the real dirty secret. You will disappoint yourself. At some point, you will let you down. But I want to tell you one that has never disappointed me. His name is Jesus Christ. Would you look at the verse? The Bible says now. It's, it's present tense. I like that. He's not a past tense God. He's a present tense God. In fact, that word now is found twice in the previous verse. See, we got to live in the now. <laughs> Be honest. How many of you would like to hit the rewind button and go back in our culture to a time before some of this mess was going on? Would you raise your hand? Okay, the bad news is you can't do that. How many of you would like to hit the fast forward button and jump through all of this mess we're dealing with right now as a country? Yes? I'm sorry, you can't do that either, but I'm going to tell you what you can do. You can trust in the God who is not past tense or future tense. He is the I am. He is the present tense God. Look, he's in our now with us. God is a very present help in time of trouble. And now abideth. It's not just present, it's permanent. God doesn't come certain seasons. God comes into your life when you receive him, and he comes to stay he abides with you. He comes to live in you. Then he makes a way where you can go live with him forever. I'd say that's a pretty good deal. And now abideth faith. So this is enough for tonight. What last? I tell you tonight, we need a faith at last. In the end, the only thing in your life that really is going to matter is what connects you to God. Someday we'll all come to the end. We'll all get, look please, we'll all get right to the edge of it. And we'll step out of this world and into the next. And I don't know when that will be, but we've all been reminded, even in recent months, of how fragile life is. And someday I will breathe my last year and my first in the presence of a holy God and I will answer to God for the one life God gave me. And on that day, look please, on that day it's going to be sight. The only thing that's going to matter on that day is this. Did I have faith in God now, here? I was near our nation's capital the other day. I was flying through Reagan National in Washington. That's the airport where when you fly in, you see all of the monuments. and It's a moving thing. And I'm in the airport in a certain place, and I saw this man. It was a businessman, and our paths crossed. And when they did, I took a little piece of paper like this one out of my pocket, different than this one, but it had the gospel on it. And I said, could I give you something to read about knowing Jesus as your personal Savior? And immediately he responded to me, oh, sir, I'm a man of faith. I had not planned on his response. I certainly had not planned on my response to his response. But at that moment, I said to him, faith in what? And he looked at me kind of stunned for a moment I said the truth of the matter is it's not enough to simply say I have faith faith in what or the better question is faith in whom faith in faith I hear some people talking about faith like well I'm a man of faith I, I believe there's a God did you know the devil believes there's a God 
Faith in faith is not enough. Faith in a church, faith, faith in a baptism, faith in good works, faith in what? I've been pondering that man's statement to me in our brief interchange there in that airport the last few days, and I've come to some conclusions. The first conclusion I've come to is that the origin of our faith has to be the Word of God. See, that's why I'm reading to you from the Bible tonight. I didn't come to make a speech. I'm sorry. I, I didn't come to entertain you. I came to give you God's message. I don't have a message. I came to give you God's message because the Bible says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you want faith, if you need faith, let me tell you how to get faith. You don't get faith by even asking God to give you faith. You get faith by reading what God says in His Word, and the truth of the Word of God will build faith inside of you. As you read the truth, God will confirm that truth in your heart and faith will begin to grow. So the origin of our faith is God himself. You know, it's sad. It really is sad, but lots of things in our world get substituted for faith. Effort. Somebody said, I'm, look, I'm trying. I'm really trying here. Well, good, but there's a word of difference between trying and trusting. Your efforts, my efforts, they all fall short. No man can fix the mess our country's in right now. No human being on earth can, can straighten out all the problems in the world, and no person can meet the deepest needs of your life. Only God can do that. And the origin of our faith has to be the unchanging truth of the Word of God. God said His Word was forever settled in heaven. You know why I'm preaching from the Bible tonight? Because there's only one thing that transcends every culture and every generation. It is the truth of God's Word. The Bible says truth endures to every generation. So if you're young, if you're old, if you're in church, if you're out of church, if you're educated or uneducated, it doesn't matter. We all get faith the same way. It begins with what God reveals about Himself in His book, the Bible. Emotions sometimes get substituted for faith. People get a chill up their spine. They hear a really nice song, and they have some euphoric experience and emotion. Can I tell you what I've discovered about myself? My emotions change. Sometimes I can feel really good, and sometimes I don't feel good at all. And if you ride the emotional roller coaster, you're going to ride it all of your life. Your faith must not be rooted in how you feel. Your faith must be rooted in something that never changes, and that is God's truth. It lasts. And in a world filled with fear right now, people are gripped by fear of the future and what's going to happen and what of our kids and our grandkids. I say to you tonight on the authority of God's Word, have faith in God. Secondly, I came to this conclusion. Not only does the origin of our faith have to be the Word of God, the object of our faith has to be the Lord Himself. I'm not asking you to trust me tonight. Would you look me in the eye? I'm not asking you to trust me tonight. I'm going to ask every person in this building when I finish speaking if you'll be willing to trust God. Right where you are, with whatever the need in your life is, I'm going to ask you tonight if you'll be willing to have faith in God I think the greatest definition of faith in all of Scripture is found in the book of Hebrews where the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The word looking literally means take your eyes off of one thing and fix it on something else. It'd be like if I were fixed on Brother Fox right now, and that's something I need to turn away from. And so I remove my sight from him, and I fix it on my wife, who's up here somewhere, much more beautiful to look at, I make a conscious decision of the will, a choice to look away from this and look to another. Look, please. I'm saying to you tonight, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Look away from yourself to Jesus. Look away from a church to Jesus. Look away from a preacher to Jesus. Look away from your good works to Jesus. Look away from this world to Jesus. Get your eyes on Jesus, and he will save you. Faith is like a telescope. You don't have a telescope to look at the telescope. You have the telescope to look off yonder to something far greater and far grander. We don't have a faith to sit around and celebrate on Sunday and say, we have faith and we look at it every now and then. No, no, we look through the lens of faith and through Scripture unto Jesus who alone can meet the deepest needs of our life. 
I was in Texas the other day. I got a friend. He's in his 80s. He's still an energetic witness for Christ. And we were having a meal together. And he said to me, I went to the doctor the other day. And he said, they sat me in the room. And he said, I waited. My wife and I and the nurse came in. And he said, she didn't say hello. She didn't greet us. She didn't smile. She wasn't pleasant. She didn't even speak. She probably having a hard day. She started going about her business. And he said, finally, I just looked at her and said, could I share some good news with you? Kind of startled her and she said, yes, sir. And he said, God loves you. She started weeping. She said, sir, I don't know who you are, but I sure needed to hear that today. He said, I got better news than that. God not only loves you, he loved you so much, he sent his son to die for you and rise from the dead. And if you'll receive him as your savior, you can have eternal life. He said, isn't that good news? He said, she said, it is good news. And then my friend, you have to know him, said to her, but it's, it's something you've got to choose, ma'am. God won't choose it for you, and I can't choose it for you. My wife can't choose it for you. No, you'll have to choose. He said, there's a real heaven and there's a real hell, and those who come to know Christ as Savior will spend eternity with him in heaven, and those who reject the simple gospel message will be separated from God forever because of their sin in hell, and you've got to choose. He said, at that moment, she whirled around, and she looked him in the face, and she said, I choose heaven. And I say, if you choose heaven, what you're saying is I choose Jesus because Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And I wonder tonight, will you choose Jesus? The third little conclusion I came to regarding faith is that not only is there an origin of faith, it comes from the Word, and there's an object to faith, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, but there is an overcoming to faith. The Bible says it abides. It lasts. It clothes will wear out. The money you work so hard to get, you'll spend it. How many of you know money doesn't last? Yes? I mean, it's there and then it's gone. Where did it go? It makes itself wings and flies away. But watch, please, God's eternal life, that's better than a million dollars. You can never spend that up. It lasts. And John wrote in 1 John chapter 5 and said, And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. You want to be an overcomer? You want to live above circumstances? You want to be delivered of your sin? You want to spend eternity with God in heaven? There's only one way. You must put your faith in Christ and Christ alone for your soul's salvation. Only Jesus can say. How many of you remember where you were on 9-11? Me too. That morning, a 32-year-old businessman got on an airplane, headed to San Francisco. He was a Christian. He would not make it to San Francisco because his plane would be hijacked in a matter of moments. It became clear through conversations with people on the ground, interaction online, uh, that other planes had been hijacked, flown into the World Trade Center. And this young man sprang into action. You know him now. He's famous as Todd Beamer. Todd Beamer picked up the phone on that United 93 plane, used a credit card to get an operator on the line, asked her if she was a Christian. Isn't that interesting? I mean, he's, he's, he's staring death in the face. And he's thinking about God and spiritual things. Are you a Christian? Yes. He said, I want you to get a message to my wife that I love her. And then he said, would you pray with me? And they prayed together on the phone. They quoted Psalm 23 together. And the last words she heard him say, they become famous now, were not spoken to her. They were spoken to three other men with him, were these words, are you ready? Let's roll. Todd Beamer and three of his friends charged the terrorist, caused the plane not to reach its mark and go down in a rural field in Pennsylvania. His wife, Lisa, wrote an amazing book about his life, and in it she wrote these words. In my braver moments, 
I dared to ponder what Todd might have experienced aboard that plane before it went down. I wondered if he'd been injured or even possibly killed by the terrorist. But she said this, I felt strongly that Todd's final thoughts and expressions would have been on two things. His love for his family and his faith in God. You love your family. They love you. But I want you to know something, friends. When you get to the end, faith in God matters. It's not just enough that you have a family. Are you a member of the family of God? Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Do you know Jesus is your Savior? Most things are not going to last. Hear me now with your heart. Most things are not going to last. You're going to last. You've got an eternal soul. One million years from this moment, you're going to be living somewhere. And I say to you, the only way to have victory now and life eternal is through simple faith in Jesus Christ.